our first session it will be a panel of representatives from the MIT Committee on Academic Freedom and Campus Expression. And I know it's a mouthful, but the way you pronounce the abbreviation is CAFC. So that panel will be moderated by Chessie Templeton Wheeler, who is the uh, treasurer of the MIT Free Speech Alliance. And Chessie will uh, also introduce our panelists. So Chessie, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Peter. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I will very quickly introduce the audience to a small background of CAFC. And then uh, Michael Spicer will, Spitzer, sorry, will um, <laughs> continue that conversation. Um, I'd like to say, like most institutions, MIT is not immune to seemingly endless ad hoc committee formations. But in the case of CAFC, it's a welcome progression in the fight for establishing free and open expression throughout MIT. CAFC came together in the early days of 2023 um, after the MIT Statement on Freedom of Expression and Academic Freedom was adopted by the MIT faculty. Prior to that, um, in January 2022, CAFC's predecessor, the Free Expression Working Group, which we called internally the FUG, um, if you will, was formed. And in June of that year, the FUG issued its report and recommendations. CAFC was, only, was not only a natural outgrowth of its predecessor, but a necessary one. One that promises to continue tackling the challenges that MIT community faces in its pursuit to reestablish a robust and healthy environment where the vigorous exchange of differing ideas, viewpoints, and debate are held in the highest regard. CAFC is charged with developing um, a campus expression roadmap for the institute and to propose steps to advance the FUG report recommendation. To that end, join me in welcoming our panels, Michael Sipser, Pekka, Pekka Hasoy, as well as our student member, Angie Jo. And I will give you brief, um, brief bios of all of them. Michael Sipser is the Donner Professor of Mathematics and member of the Computer Science and Artificial, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in 1980 and joined the MIT faculty the same year. He has served as chairman of Applied Mathematics and the head of the mathematics department, as well as the interim dean and dean of science. He's the author of the widely used textbook, Introduction to the Theory of Computation. His distinctions include multiple MIT Graduate Student Council teaching awards, the MIT School of Science Stud Student Advising Award, and the UC Berkeley Distinguished Alumni Award, and the Margaret McVicker Faculty Fellowship. He is a fellow of the American Academy, Academy of Arts and Science. Pekko Hasoy is the Neil and Jane Papalardo Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Professor, professor of Mathematics. She is the co-founder of the MIT Sports Lab, which connects the MIT community with pro teams and industry partners to address data and engineering challenges in the sports domain. Pekko joined the Department of Mechanical Engineering in 2002 as an assistant professor after receiving an AB in physics from Princeton University, and an MBA and PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. She has received numerous awards, including the APS Stanley Corson Award, the Bose Award for Excellence in Teaching, and the Jacob P. Den Hartog Distinguished Educator Award. She is a fellow of the American Physical Society, a Radcliffe Institute fellow, and a McVicker faculty fellow. Angie Jo is a PhD candidate in political economy at MIT. Her dissertation research examines the differences in how the welfare states of advanced industrialized democracies respond to collective crisis risk, such as COVID-19, the financial crisis, and natural disasters. She's particularly interested in how the institutional, political, and ideological constraints of liberal welfare regimes shape the menu of state interventions that are available to them in the times of crisis. Angie holds a Master's of City Planning degree from MIT, during which she studied master plan cities and industrial policy in China and South Korea. Prior to MIT, she earned an AB summa cum laude in architecture studies from Harvard. Angie is a recipient of the Homer A. Burnell Presidential Graduate Fellowship at MIT and the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Doctoral Scholarship. Thank you, Michael. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Michael Pico and Angie for joining us. Do you want to start off with? Sure. Um, thank you, Chessie. Uh, thank you all for being here. And thanks to Wayne and Peter and the MIT Free Speech Al Alliance uh, for organizing this important uh, uh, conference. Uh, so I am going to, um, the three of us, um, meet myself, Pekko, and Angie, are going to make some introductory remarks um, to kind of set, set the context. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the history, uh, in particular the work of the earlier uh, uh, working group 
uh, on uh, uh, free expression, uh, which we had not called fugue back then, but I, I kind of like it, so let's go with that. Um, and uh, then Pekka and Angie are going to talk about some of the current work that's going on at CAPSI. So um, I, I'm, I'm the, uh, we have two members of, the, of CAPSI who, uh, actually one of them is just, uh, has just in the process of stepping down, so perhaps it might just be me, who are, were on both. Uh, I'm a member of CAPSI, also was a member of the earlier working group. Um, so uh, let me give you a little bit of the history of the, of the origin of the first committee, which was formed in 2020, uh, in really at the beginning of 2022. Um, that uh, earlier committee, FUG, um, uh, uh, came about in the aftermath of the Dorian Abbott cancellation, which probably you all know uh, that was an outside uh, scientist who had been uh, fr from the University of Chicago, had been invited to give a scientific lecture um, at MIT, but in the interim, you know, that lecture had, was delayed, and then he had made some remarks uh, that, he, that were published and videos that were critical of affirmative action programs. Uh, some people felt that, those, that they were not appropriate um, uh, and didn't want uh, someone uh, to, uh, uh, with that perspective, public perspective, to um, be representing MIT at a public lecture uh, where there were going to be high school students present and, and so on. And so uh, the decision was made to cancel his lecture. And that got a lot of media attention, um, also a lot of internal criticism at MIT. Uh, that all happened in the fall of 2021. And then, um, uh, uh, after all of that concern, there was a uh, committee formed at MIT to look into our free speech policies, and that was this committee FUG. Um, I was asked to be on that committee in, in, in January of 2021, and I had an interest in the topic. I'm not, you know, I'm a mathematician. I have no particular expertise on uh, these kinds of questions, but I was interested uh, uh, partly because uh, I, I, I personally, as like many of my colleagues, felt that it was a mistake to have canceled that uh, talk. And also, I felt that the general climate at MIT of self-censorship, um, which is something I, I did experience, I had some understanding of, I had some ideas for how to kind of address that, um, was something that was important to me. And so uh, I decided, okay, I'll join this committee and see what I can do to help. Um, uh, let me tell you a little, little bit, bit about that earlier committee, uh, because that sort of set the stage for the current committee, CAPSI. Um, so that earlier FUG uh, committee um, was comprised of 12 faculty um, representing all of the five schools at MIT. And there were also, uh, in addition, eight non-voting partners, we call them, who represented different constituencies, um, uh, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, staff, alumni, and maybe a couple of others. Um, uh, so that, that was the way the, the constitution of that uh, uh, FUG committee. Um, Penny Chisholm and Phil Gray were the co-chairs. We met weekly uh, throughout the spring term of 2022. Um, and uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we started by reviewing various background materials, such as the Chicago Principles, the Pan America Guidelines. Um, and sort of interestingly in the way that committee worked, uh, it was it worked by the, the rules that were set out by the co-chairs was that the committee would issue a report and we all had to agree. Um, so there was a required consensus. There was not gonna be an opportunity for a minority, a minority report. So everybody had to be on board with whatever we, the uh, committee reported. And so that effectively gave everybody a veto. Um, uh, and uh, interestingly, that forced a lot of compromise among the members of the committee. And in, as a result, the, uh, the, I think the result came out better. Um, uh, because, you know, there were a, a diversity of viewpoints among the faculty um, on that committee. And so they, uh, you know, we had to figure out how to forge something that everybody could sign off on. Um, uh, I, I could also mention that there was some some, some um, 
disagreement about the makeup of the committee. People felt that the students on the committee, at least, should be voting members. Um, I personally think that the, uh, the, the makeup of that committee for what its purpose was, was correct, and the fac only the faculty were voting members, but you, know, you could argue, th argue that both ways. Um, in the end, the result was a 50-page report, 55-page uh, report um, in the summer of 2022 that described our process, our principles, the background, and, and the inputs that we reviewed. Um, it reviewed MIT's existing policies. It included a two-page summary statement that served as MIT's version of the Chicago principles. And it made 10 recommendations and gave 12 illustrative scenarios. Um, uh, let, let me just say a little bit about the charge to that committee. Um, uh, so the, the, the charge was we were supposed to review MIT's statement and policies on free expression, uh, review the Chicago principles and other scholarship, review community input uh, from the various, we, we, there was a lot of people who are uh, you know, expressing things that we had to review. Um, and you know, we were revising our current statement as needed and what uh, came up with um, what we thought were the principles. This was part of the charge. We had to educate the, how do we educate the community and uh, what, would be, what, are we, what would be our recommended process for um, resolving disagreements around free expression. And uh, after that, in summer 2023, CAPSI was formed to find implementation strategies for our recommendations of the earlier committee. Um, Pekka and I were the co-chairs. Um, uh, the events of October 2023, um, uh, with the attack on uh, Israel and the ensuing Israel-Hamas war, you know, changed some of the character of our committee, bringing increased visibility and importance to CAPSI. Um, and I'll leave you know that whole discussion to uh, to, my, to my colleagues to talk about that. But I do want to close by mentioning some of the recommendations that our uh, committee had. Um, one of them was that we make a uh, statement, sort of analogous to the Chicago statement, which would be uh, considered and perhaps uh, adopted by the faculty. Um, so we did that. It's in the original report. That statement, uh, which is two pages long, summarizing kind of the 55 pages of the full report, um, was considered by the faculty over a course of uh, four full f uh, faculty meetings. Um, so these are hour and a half meetings where the whole faculty were participating. Um, a lot of interesting discussion, and uh, but uh, you know it was it was, I'm, it was unprecedented from what, that the faculty as a whole would be uh, talking about one topic for that that amount of time. And um, uh, in the end, there were a few, I think, not that significant amendments made. Uh, there were a lot of amendments that were proposed, either to strengthen it or weaken it. But in the end, we came up with something very close to what the committee had originally put together. And I think that's a testament to the process and the outcome that the committee came up with that was basically um, uh, a good compromise um, over the, lot, the many different views on how to go about free expression on, on, on the campus. Um, and uh, then there were a bunch of other recommendations. I think I've talked too long already. So let me pass this on and pass it over to Peko, and she can uh, talk about the various recommendations from the, uh, from the first committee and use that as, that was sort of one of the starting points for CAPSI, you know, to figure out how to implement those recommendations. So uh, Peko? Take it from there. Thank you. If you want to take a look at the recommendations, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> we rehearsed that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, I, I just want to read, sort of echo one of the things that Mike said, that these discussions with the faculty were extraordinary. Like, I've been at MIT now for almost 25 years, and I have never seen a faculty meet. Our faculty meetings are usually ex incredibly boring, and these were not boring discussions. Um, so so I, I, think, um, I think we actually did come up with something that the, that the faculty are, are ready to, to stand behind. Um, uh, the other most important thing that I have to want to tell you is that CAFC has a website, cafce.mit.edu. 
cafce.mit.edu, and all the documents that Mike has, has been talking about, you can find there. So you can find the charge of Fugue, you can find the charge of uh, CAFSI, you can find the statement on freedom of expression and any of the recommendations that we make. So we, we try to be extre extremely transparent. Um, so you should be able to see all of our discussions as they evolve. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me, I just wanna start by saying, um, I mean, I guess we should acknowledge last year was a very unusual year. <laughs> um, I think that uh, the fact that we had Fugue in, that Fugue happened more than a year ago, that we had CAFSI in place before October 7th, that we had the statement on, um, on freedom of expression in place before October 7th was actually incredibly helpful for us at MIT. Um, yeah, honestly, we got lucky with the timing and um, uh, it, it, we ha still have a long ways to go, but those, those documents have been very helpful as we've navigated this past year. Um, so as, as Mike said, uh, CAFSI was, was stood up um, to implement the, well, to develop a roadmap to implement the recommendations from Fugue, the previous committee. Um, and uh, w one of the things that we heard was that um, w while Fugue was a faculty dominated committee, since these recommendations were gonna impact all different p parts of the community, that there should be broader representation. So CAFSI has five faculty, four staff, and four students. Um, I'm just gonna give a shout out to the students who have been incredible on this, on this committee. Like, like uh, honestly, a lot of the stuff that we, you'll, you'll hear from Angie, some of the things that the students have done, but um, um, like their voice um, and their work on this committee has been really essential to getting things going. Um, so in the charge to CAFSI, uh, the number one part, part of the charge was to build the roadmap to implement the recommendations of Fugue. Um, number two was to serve as a resource to the community when people have questions about freedom of expression or when there are conflicts or challenges or situations that are difficult to navigate that involve freedom of expression. And we have, so we have done that as well. We've had a number of um, different offices come to us for advice when, um, when there are complaints that come up in this space. Um, uh, and then, you, you know, like, like Mike said, I think both of us got interested in this because we were, we were concerned about campus climate. And um, we, we would like to see a, a climate where dissenting opinions are not just tolerated, but they are welcomed and embraced because they broaden the way we think and they make us better as a community. Um, and that is something that we've struggled with for, for many years. And so we, this, is, this was sort of why we wanted to do this. And then of course, October 7th happened and so um, it was, suddenly there were a lot of other things that were on fire. Um, uh, so, okay, so, so, the, so the other thing that has actually taken up a lot of CAFSI's time uh, because of the climate that we've been in in the last year is to look at the MIT policies and, um, and think about where do they abut or intersect with freedom of expression and are our policies written in a way um, that, um, that safeguards our values around, sa around freedom of, of expression. Um, so, and the, the way we do that, um, and a, this is, a lot of our time has been taken up doing this, is um, we, so first we think about principles. The, the committee is actually great about thinking through what are our principles, how do we, you know, how do we want to think about, think through these um, uh, in sort of a, um, I mean, in a principled manner. Um, but we're also fairly practical. So, for example, um, w one of the first policies we decided to take a look at was the postering policy, which we thought, oh, that'll be easy. Yeah, not so, <laughs> okay, it turns out not so easy. So, uh, but what we did, and this was actually, my, this was Mike's idea. So Mike actually wandered around campus and started taking pictures of posters. <laughs> and we made, a, we made a poll for the committee and we sent it out and we said, A, do you think this is in violation of the policy the way it's currently written? Um, and B, do you think it should be a, a violation of the policy given our principles around freedom of expression and what we've written in the statement around freedom of expression? And so that gave us a really practical sort of way, lens to view the policies and to understand where do they actually clash with things that are happening on campus, right? So we've tried to, tried to blend that sort of high level, uh, um, more academic approach with this really sort of practical implementation. Um, and those recommendations we also post, so you can see the recommendations for the postering policy under recommendations. There are probably, I would say, one if not two more coming um, this fall around both the harassment policy and the, and the protest policy. Um, so, okay, so, so that a lot of our time has been spent on that. If I go through some of the recommendations to see um, how, how well we've done <laughs> going down our to-do list, um, so number one, like Mike said, is that uh, the faculty should consider and potentially adopt a statement. Check, done. Um, 
uh, revise our policies to strengthen commitment to freedom of expression. So that's sort of all the ongoing policy discussions, which is, I mean, that's, that's where a lot of the kind of the, the devil is in the details in that work, and it just takes time. Um, create a freedom of expression website. That, in a second, I'm gonna hand off to Angie, who has spearheaded that effort, and I think is one of the most important things that CAFC has, has done in the last year. Um, then uh, develop a resource for contested issues we're currently serving as that resource, but we need to make some recommendations about what that would look like moving forward. Um, then there are a number of things, like, of things like Mike has said that have to do with sort of um, education and engaging the community in, in matters of free expression. Uh, you know, honestly, that has fallen a little bit to the wayside just because there are so many other issues that, we're, that are not only MIT, but all campuses are dealing with right now, but I think that's something we have to keep an eye on. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's sort of what, uh, yeah, I think that, that kind of summarizes what's on the list. So, I, you know, I would say we're, we're maybe uh, a third of the way through. Um, so, I, you know, g given, what, given what the environment has been on campus, um, I, I, I hadn't looked at this list in a while, so we, to do this panel, we actually pulled it out, and I was like, ah, actually, we're, we're further along this list than I thought we were gonna be. <laughs> Um, but I, I do want to, so I think I'm going to stop there because I do want to take, have time for questions from you guys. Um, uh, and I'm going to hand off um, to Angie first. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, toss her a pitch about the, to start with the website, but I think, um, Angie, anything you want to say about the student perspective on the committee would be great. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mike and Pecco, and uh, to the um, Free Speech Alliance for having us. So um, I was asked to actually start by talking about what got me on the panel or on the, on the committee and what got me in, involved and then to go into the website, so I'll do that. Um, so uh, I, I, I often represent like the student perspective even though I'm only one student, um, but my experience is that I came to go to college in the US at Harvard in 2012, um, but I came from Korea at, at an international school, so I was quite, um, taken aback at that time because the American sort of liberal arts um, college environment uh, was seeing the kind of the rise of ideas like safe spaces, you know, microaggressions, cancel culture, trigger warnings. That's something that was really salient to me as, um, as an undergraduate. And of course, these were motivated by really um, good uh, reasons. Um, <clears throat> But I think that one thing I took away from my time in college was that we didn't have the accompanying education uh, on the principles of free and open expression, the value of free expression protecting these rights, um, and how to do it well when it's so difficult, when there are such um, frictions that can arise, uh, when people can be hurt from um, free expression sometimes, uh, but how to kind of counterbalance these, these um, these very important principles, um, and not just think about the cost of it and how to sort of protect people through suppressing potentially hurtful speech. So now as a PhD student, um, and I've been in the US you know, over 10 years now, um, I, I, I teach undergrads, and I realize that they're living in an even more sort of sensorial um, and, and often with, you know, coming from very good intentions, good intentions um, regarding social justice and um, diversity and inclusion, um, but but they still uh, don't know kind of how to think through the principles of free speech um, and how to again weigh these at times um, these principles that might be in tension with each other. So um, so in that sense, I think it's unfair to expect students or community members to behave in the way that we want when like, we ourselves are not sure how to think through these issues and we don't see great examples put in front of us. Um, and uh, when I joined the committee, I, I thought it, these kinds of ideas should be as important, um, you know, should be as central a part of freshman orientation as the other things we teach them when they arrive on campus, like um, you know, about sexual misconduct or consent or academic integrity and you know, not plagiarizing. So how do we actually communicate these ideas and have you know, solid thinking behind them to begin with? Um, so that uh, led me to um, 
push for the creation of a website as a sort of first resource where we could centralize all of the you know, myriad policies that exist at MIT, but not just the policies, also how they intersect with, um, with national laws and uh, other frameworks of thinking about free expression, how they, um, how they uh, interact with other principles around harassment or discrimination, sometimes the very blurry gray areas that can emerge, um, and think through them and present them in a way that's, uh, that's balanced, that shows that there's, there are gray areas, that there is room for disagreement, that often these are adjudicated through discretion, they're not hard and fast uh, rules. Um, and show them through scenarios. So, you know, let's say that you're a student and you're in an online forum, someone says something, um, you know, how do you react in that scenario? And these are, these are situations that students are facing every day. Um, so principles, scenarios that they often run, run into, also ways to disagree well. So again, like Peko said, we're not trying to avoid disagreement um, and friction. We're trying to use disagreement to cultivate the most vibrant community we have. So um, how to do that in concrete ways. And also governance, like again, going back to law and MIT policy, these are very specific. And sometimes policies differ across institutions in ways that are historical, you know, historical contingencies. So how to understand those and really think through, okay, if I want to plan a protest, if I want to plan a counter protest, if I want to uh, write an essay, if I want to approach uh, MIT leadership, how do I do that? Um, so all of these things we try to pull together and put on one central website that's designed to be um, a good resource for community members and students. So this website, which is different from our institution, well, our committee website is uh, free slash expression dot MIT dot edu. Um, and I think, like Pekka was saying, the next step here would be to not just have this website as a central resource, but to think through ways to um, get it out to the students, especially early on in their, in their academic careers. Um, and again, make it as sort of central uh, a topic of, of, of discourse and education as uh, all the other things that we think it's important for them to learn when they come to campus. Thank you. Um, you know, I had a question about the website and um, in particular the free hyphen expression .mit .edu website and how you how do you think the recommendations will look in the roadmap to use that website, particularly something that whether it could be a module like a learning module in um, orientation or something during um, IEP um, and how do you yeah so how how are you thinking the future of that website can be integrated more widely into common use um, on campus um, for students and faculty and administration. I'll just, I'll jump in really quick, but I'm, I'm actually gonna let Angie say something about that as well. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that we've, so we, we've actually done a lot of um, uh, sort of just informal polling to ask people what, what are the right sort of um, venues to introduce these ideas. And um, you know, the first thing everybody says it should, is it should be orientation. And what we've heard is that orientation is very overstuffed. Yes. And um, we're, I, at least I, we, we have to think through this, but I'm a little nervous. I don't want it to get lost in, in a pile of 50 other things they're trying to take in. Um, so I, I think that's another thing that we have to think about is how do we introduce this in a way that is sticky and that it doesn't get overwhelmed by all of the other things that the students are, are dealing with. Right, because you're not going to change a culture by a 20 minute module right. on something. It's really, it's the, 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 the culture has been so pervasive, per, perverted, I should say, um, that it's, and like we're saying, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and how are you, how do you make it sticky along uh, throughout everybody's journey here? Yeah. So by the way, if anybody has ideas on how to make it sticky, please tell us. It's great. We're we're in that that phase where we're thinking about that. Um, I don't know, Angie. Do you have thoughts on what's sticky for students? I think what's actually most impactful from from the student perspective is when MIT administration takes certain actions that um, abut 
you know, mm -hmm. principles of free speech, um, that they really explain mm -hmm. and are very transparent about their reasoning and the policies that, um, that come out of that reasoning. So, I mean, all of the events surrounding the, the protests last semester, I think so much harm was done by um, just in the fact that a lot of the organizers, I mean, there's obviously a, a very, very large spectrum of where people stand on this, on this issue and how they behaved, but many um, members of the community just were not aware of the kind of time, place, manner restrictions that, ex that pre-existed the conflict, um, that, uh, you know, like the administration's considerations on balancing free expression versus other, other principles that are also important, and I think there were a lot of inconsistencies that were perceived from the community side that were not fully explained. So because these events have, you know, they hold so much um, salience, I think to, it's, it would be great to use the opportunities to explain the mm -hmm. reasoning behind them. Yeah. Um, I have uh, two questions related. So I'm gonna jump to one that's a, a bit after that. Um, so one small note in your charter did state the committee may also make recommendations on urgent matters related to academic freedom on campus expression. I think we know those urgent matters now. Um, the architects of the charter could not have anticipated the scope and breadth of what would soon become the dominant urgent matter affecting MIT and indeed college campuses worldwide. Um, but clearly conditions were ripe for that kind of perfect storm we saw this past academic year. Can you talk a little bit about how CAPSI reacted and engaged around the campus protests that erupted in the wake of the Hamas attack on um, Israel in October? Well, maybe I can say a little bit about it. Just as you know, it's it's difficult to bring up specific incidents uh, where we um, uh, made recommendations because some of those are kind of confidential. Um, but uh, you know, what kind of thing that was, um, you know, there was some department or entity at MIT, official entity at MIT, that was at least uh, the impression that w we initially had was that it was inviting some very, very controversial speakers um, that might be seen as uh, um, you know, very extreme. And so uh, th that was uh, a concern that was brought, for brought to us because you know, it's, it's fine for different groups to invite speakers, but for actual de academic departments um, or official entities, that sort of gives the impression that MIT has, is taking a side um, on these difficult issues. So, uh, you know, we looked into it, we looked into the details, um, you know, we gave some feedback. It turned out that, you know, the accusation was inaccurate. There wasn't really such a... Um, uh, you know, it, it was somewhat overblown what the accusation was. So um, it ended up being kind of a moot point. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, the kinds of things that we said was that, well, if you're going to have a speaker of, a, you know, that's very, very to one side, perhaps we should either provide resources or provide a, a suggestion that they try to have a balanced uh, perspective and invite some someone from representing the other side. Um, and that's... Again, individual groups are free, you know, if it's, you know, the, the uh, MIT student Republican group, you know, they don't have to invite a Democrat to, to uh, speak. But if it's a, you know, if it's the, you know, a certain department or, you know, so, some official um, uh, supposedly neutral party at MIT is inviting someone, then they should try to make it more balanced. That, that was our, kind of our feedback, at least. That was my recollection of the event. I don't know if you had a f no, no, version of that. That's absolutely true. And I, actually, I, I want to emphasize something on that: is that a lot? You know, a lot of people will, would send complaints to us, and we would think, "Oh my God, I can't believe this is actually happening." And it turns out it was not actually happening. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, that's the first thing we learned: is that a, a lot of these people who are who think the world is ending, it, that the world might not be ending. Let, so do, you know, make a couple of phone calls and find out what actually happened, right? So I, I think that's one of the things that we've definitely learned. You know, another, another example, and again, like Mike said, we have to be a little bit vague since these are all very specific people or entities at MIT, um, is we did have an office come to us um, 
who ask, so they had they had people who were who were very public facing. Like there would be, they would maybe be at a desk, and um, you know, people from the MIT community or, or outside the MIT community would inter intersect with them. And the question was, what you know, how what is the what is the level of appropriateness of let's say attire to show that you support one side or another, right? A am I allowed to exercise my right of freedom of expression in the hat that I wear or something when I am manning this public facing desk? Right, and so you know, so we we kind of help people talk through that, and we ask them, okay, well, is this is this hindering the way they're doing their job because we're paying them to do a job, and um, uh, if this is if this is infringing in their ability to do that task, then maybe it's a problem. If it, you know, so I mean, there's so there's uh, th there were those kinds of uh, issues that we sort of helped helped people talk think through. Angie, for you. Um, your, your dissertation works, um, work centers around collective crisis risk. As a political economist, how did your work on CAFC, along with your PhD studies, inform your perspective and reaction to both college, um, but also tr trans-urban protests that occurred across um, many industrialized uh, democracies throughout the world? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a deep question. 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 Yeah. Um, well, I guess over the course of the last year, I also traveled a lot for my, my dissertation work. And it's been interesting to see how the, the war in Gaza, um, how that sort of refracted through different college campuses in, uh, like I went to Germany and I was in the UK. And seeing that the way that very similar uh, protests are being treated very differently across different institutions and different national contexts, you know, again, due to their own historical legacies or the political coalitions behind um, certain groups or, you know, the donor bases of different ins institutions. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that I always think about in political economy. Like, why do we see, especially, especially in comparative political economy, why do we see similar risks or similar phenomena being uh, responded to in very different ways across countries, across institutions, and why did we arrive at those different conclusions? Um, and this ties into free speech because, you know, it again shows that there is no, like, well, nobody has come to the single one correct answer. <laughs> um, and it really depends on how society is, um, how, how it lands on that particular society. Uh, but I think, like, going back to your, uh, the question before, one thing that I think was very interesting for political science students who were quite involved, uh, as you can imagine, in the, in the, in the protests um, and in discourse around it, is that um, I think in the beginning of the year, people were really bringing up free expression as the one framework to try to govern people's actions and uh, opinions. So, you know, if someone is protesting on, on whatever side in this context, is that allowed by, by free speech rules? Um, but I think what we as a committee, you know, worked through and tried to communicate to the community as, as more time went on is that there are other frameworks to think through these issues. So there are other principles and considerations at MIT around respectful conduct and, um, creating the kind of community want, we, we want, uh, as well as, you know, some people may take into, you know, may be fully aware that they're violating uh, whatever policies we have governing free expression and other codes of conduct, but, um, but they're going to do it anyway because they truly believe that this disruption um, or this, um, you know, raising this issue in a particular way is, is justified based on, you know, how they see the situation. So the CAFC statement uh, that we put out directly um, in response to the encampment protests, it, it uses the framework of civil disobedience, which was not really in the discourse before that. So I think it's important that, um, you know, th this is not the one and only uh, monolithic framework that we use to discuss these super complex issues. I'm, I'm gonna add to, I think that's actually a really important because I think one of the things we have seen in the last year is people do try to shoehorn everything into free speech 
and that not everything is free speech. Like, I, I, I'll give an example that I, I just learned of yesterday. There was a, um, a speaker who came to campus that some people disagreed with, um, and so some students went and they took the pizzas that were served there. And I'm like, okay, I don't think that's a free speech issue. That's a pizza issue, <laughs> right? That's a, right? So, so it's, you know, I mean, there's things like that where not, not everything has to be fit into, the, into this particular framework. Um, I, I would like to just one more question, if you don't mind, about related to to the campus protest and free speech, and bringing it back to like it doesn't necessarily need to be under that lens. But I, I say this particularly because at MIT, um, the free speech culture specifically had devolved into a very self-censoring environment. Um, partially through some of that was DEI teaching, such as bystander training and reporting um, to the IDHR, um, which is the Institute's um, Discrimination and Harassment Response Office, for perceived microaggressions. And then we quickly pivoted from this culture to um, where you can face disciplinary action for misgendering someone, or, or like we pointed out with the Abbott cancellation, a scholar could be canceled for expressing views on merit, fairness, and equity um, over, uh, over um, hiring practices that um, are more affirmative action-based and to what became very vociferous protests calling for what some would say are hate speech that perhaps, which we do know is um, protected speech, but would perhaps did cross the line into harassment. So how, like, how do you come to terms with such a cultural shift? It's not necessarily that it was civic disobedience, it was just that like, there were no holds barred when it came to things that could be said all of a sudden. Um, and weeks prior, again, like there was, I, I, I did receive a thing for bystander training, which I had no idea what it was. But to, if you happen to see somebody having an argument and you're walking by or they're saying things that are not okay to say, how do you as a bystander uh, approach it? And so it's such a sensitivity um, that had, had, has been promoted. Um, and then we quickly just, like I said, no holds barred. So how do we marry those concepts? Um, particularly at MIT, but other places too, had, had, had faced similar kind of environmental shifts. Well, l l that, l uh, let me try to take a stab at that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, I think in you know I, I think there has been a shift um, you know from a very very um, uh, a, a more restrictive uh, kind of tolerated speech, not maybe not officially tolerated, but just you know the way, what was acceptable speech, um, where there were concerns about microaggressions and that whole um, uh, that whole kind of uh, arena of what would be kind of people were frowning on uh, to what we're seeing now, where there's a much more wide berth being given to what's sort of acceptable speech, um, uh, which can be you know range into you know. Pretty, uh, pretty offensive speech, but still, presumably, um, uh, you know, uh, allowed within uh, under free speech. And I think what we've tried to do as a committee is try to take a more principled approach um, to try to understand, um, you know, based on principles and based on law and based on MIT policies, what is really, what, how do you really draw the line? Um, and maybe it had gone too far in one direction prior to October 7th. And uh, you know, where uh, I think, you know, even though that's an important historical context, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily define the way we're gonna act go moving forward. And so using those principles, you know, it's got to, you know, being looked at now more carefully, you know, we're kind of you know, resetting how we're approaching these kinds of issues. And um, at least that's sort of my sense on, on how we're going about that as a committee. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna second that. You know, I think, and I think we do need to, need to take a little bit of a step back and think about this from a principal point of view. You know, if you look at the way a lot of the policies are written, they, they're very legalistic. You know, it's things like, you cannot put posters on dogs or chairs or doors or bike racks or lampposts or plants or anything, right? And it's the, you know, and somebody's like, well, what if I put it on this picture? That's not on the list, right? And so, and and I think you know, trying trying to do that to draw those lines is a losing battle, right? And you and again, I think to what Mike says, you have to think about what is the principle, and then you have to evaluate every every 
every circumstance in the framework of that principle. So, um, you, you, you know, I, I, I think I think that f some people find that frustrating because it's it's harder to t check this list. Is this allowed? Okay, but but you know. The, the fact is that even though the president's got in, in trouble for saying this in front of Congress, context matters. <laughs> um, and I think we all just have to be comfortable with understanding that context matters. Okay, I would like one last question for me and if, if, to open it up. So as you look forward ahead um, to your recommendations and the roadmap that um, you will um, be presenting to the president and the chancellor and call exactly who else, um, Recently, several universities, including Harvard, Stanford, UPenn, adopted policies of institutional neutrality, affirming their commitment to academic freedom and avoiding taking positions on political or social issues. This concept was established with the University of Chicago's Calvin Report back in 1967. It's kind of shocking that it's just coming up now at MIT, or if, maybe it hasn't, but can you talk to us as a, a possibility of a recommendation you would have, this group would have moving forward? Well, um, so I, I, I'm not sure I, I know the whole context of uh, the University of Chicago's, um, you know, various different reports and, and um, uh, thinking around these issues. But I do note that, you know, there was the Calvin Report and then there's the Chicago Principles, which is really separate, uh, two separate things. And we are not really focused so much on institutional neutrality as one of our um, key concerns um, within CAFC. We have a lot on our plate, and um, this is not w one of the things on our plate. I'll just be, that's, I don't, we're, we're not really going to address that. Okay. And any other broad issues that you may be tackling that the audience would, you, you could share with the audience at this point? I think, we, I think we've listed most, most of yeah. them, yeah. And, and, you know, and I will also say, so, so I'll say I'm, I'm a graduate of the University of Chicago, so I, I'm thumbs up Calvin. <laughs> but I will also say that, that one of the things that's been really great about this committee is that there really are a diversity of views and people, people's views change. Like, so I would not at this point want to say where, where the committee would stand on that without having a, a real discussion with the committee because they could, they could change. My, my mind has been changed by the committee. So I think... Um, um, I think those those discussions have been incredibly valuable for me, um, and I wouldn't want to second guess what comes out of what comes out of the group before having the conversation. Now's a great time. Did, any closing remarks, or should we open it up to the audience nope. for questions? Yeah. Bill. <laughs> uh, Jesse, I'd like to follow up on your comments. I'd like to ask the Capsi folks what they make of MIT professors who were outspoken opponents of accepting a free speech statement and then did a flip-flop after October 7th and formed grassroots, I would call them uh, astroturf organizations, to protect uh, Hamas protesters. And I give you, a, as a perfect example, Professor Sally Haslanger, who wrote in the faculty newsletter that only experts in normative matters, such as herself, should decide what should and should not be said on campus, who then turned into a cheerleader for the Hamas protesters. What do you make of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's have certainly been flip-floppers, and I will say there have been flip-floppers on both sides. There have been outspoken folks who suddenly feel like we, uh, who are pro-freedom of expression statement, who now suddenly are demanding trigger warnings. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it's interesting to see uh, who is uh, who is standing by their principles and who is not. <laughs> All right, just a, uh, a quick note before. I passed the mic around, which is that, wow, we, we're using a lot of the seats we have in here, but we do have a few, uh, a few open ones. And now that we've gotten to the question and answer session, uh, if you, uh, I feel like that's a, a decent time to reset if you want to come down and take a seat. Uh, um, yeah, we've got, we've got some open ones. Thank you. Thank you for pointing them out. I know we do have some in here, but I want to make sure that, uh, that everyone here is able to, uh, is able to take a seat. Yeah. And I will bring in a few extras in, in case. Okay, now we'll continue with Q&A, uh, and we'll try and speak into the microphone. Uh, and when you ask your question, why don't you first identify yourself and your affiliation? So I'm going to start with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Wayne Stargart, class of 74. Um, my recollection is that in Sally's letter to the community at the beginning of January, 
She also asked CAFC to consider and evaluate MIT's disciplinary processes. So first, is my recollection correct? Two, have you? And three, if you have, have you reached any conclusions and recommendations? Oh, so, so, so I, I actually, I don't recall that specifically. It's, a, it's certainly possible. Um, I would say that the, the disciplinary process, I mean, primarily lies with the Committee on Discipline. Um, I think Tamar Shapiro has actually been doing a really good job um, in a very difficult position this year. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that has muddied the waters is that um, in addition, so, so ultimately any, anything, the decisions ultimately lie with COD, but we also have IDHR, which has been doing a lot of the fact finding, um, and I think there has been con some confusion about how IDHR integrates with that disciplinary process, and I, that, CAFSI has not been engaged in those waters, but, um, but I think there are other people who are looking into that. Okay, thanks. Okay, hi. hi, I'm Frank Lau King, class of 84. I'm also in one of the visiting committees in chemistry. And I'm also up the muddy Charles on the CAFH, which uh, together with my friend Jeff Flyer and Steve Pinker, you see later this afternoon. So great, a, a lot of gratitude from all of us alums or whatever were involved at MIT to the Fugue group, now that I know how to pronounce it, and, and there's other, but Mike, you're one of the original members, and of course to the CAFG. I think it's really been a CAFG, it's, it's a watershed event for MIT, it really set the direction. I'm sure it was hard to negotiate and hard fought in a way, but in the end, I think you had a pretty good majority that voted for it. And then when Sally came, we all, I didn't quite know, I didn't know whether she would adopt it or send it back to committee and, or say, I want to do something else. So applause really also for Sally's leadership uh, in adopting it wholeheartedly and, and supporting it and, and living accordingly um, and, and, and helping you set or help to set up this CAFG. I think it's a, it's a wonderful direction. The one thing that I did want to mention, which I mentioned to you for, and for those of you who are in the faculty who, who will probably applaud this, is that there probably will be announced in the next few weeks a addition, a faculty committee, an MIT CAF, a Council on Academic Freedom, which, which is not an outside MFS, MA, MFSA, which is a separate group, as we all know, or not an ad hoc committee, but hopefully similarly successful and effective and a, a voice of reason and of course for viewpoint diversity and, and uh, academic freedom and all of that to give the MIT faculty a greater voice and, and probably my observation on the Harvard uh, CAFH equivalent which now is about 200 members is that the self-censorship is really going away and it takes some strength in numbers and finding oh wow there is others that don't self-censor anymore, and it seems the fear is gone, and, and you've contributed tremendously to that already. And so it's a beautiful process, and of course I think MFSA people will support all of that anyway. Great. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Preston Vorlicek, I'm a former student. Um, I was curious, in the introduction it was mentioned that MIT is falling further down on the surveys of free speech among uh, universities, and I wanted to know if it was of a concern of yours, and uh, how important do you think uh, those surveys are? I mean, personally, it's a concern of mine. I don't know if, uh, I don't know about the others. That so I wasn't aware. Um, um, maybe my bad, but that we had fallen down. I'm surprised, um, considering uh, our uh, few statement, which was adopted by the faculty and was, I think, pretty widely recognized as a as a really high quality and uh, important and, and well thought out statement. Um, and we you know we had some invited folks from I can't remember now. Uh, maybe former president of the uh, ACLU was that? I can't remember who, who, who 
blocking on exactly who the name, but um, and maybe his affiliation. But um, he said that you know this, it, it's it's the gold standard now. MIT statement is now the gold standard. Um, this is an outside person. Uh, Dr. Tomasi, uh, president of Heterodox Academy. Okay, fine, great. Uh, my, my my apologies for getting that wrong, but yeah. So we um, so I'm. I, I mean, I don't know what goes, be, goes into those surveys and what the questions were and what, exactly when that survey was taken and so on. Um, and I'm surprised and disappointed that we're uh, uh, going down in the wrong direction. But, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, hopefully through our work, we'll go back up. Yeah, and I'll also just add that it, um, sometimes things take time to percolate into the to the students, um, so the the statement is relatively new, and I hope, like Mike says, that it, it will be impactful. You know, I, I think I think Angie's um, introduction was actually really helpful in understanding that that the students, like we don't have structures right now to introduce students to this when they arrive at MIT. Like it's not here's the statement on freedom of expression. So I I think um, one of the things we do have to think about is how do we get this to permeate th through the community, and I think we've we've laid, we've put down some good cornerstones, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. I'm curious to know about the methodology. Michael said he didn't think the word methodology yeah. could be used in something like that. I would be interested in that too. Yeah. It seems like that would be an important part of your committee is to try to understand the methodology we use and whether it's appropriate or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the index that they use, I mean the methodology that they use is is written out. I mean that's their measurement and it's just a resource for us. But like any index, I mean many, many components go into it. And they're depending on how they're weighted, you know, you things can go up and down um, the index. So I think like you could just look at that and see what you think. But also, I would say like my impression of that measure is it is useful. But also, uh, universities in the U.S. are extremely different from each other. So like my younger sister, she just graduated from Brown, and her course load was like these tiny seminars where they're talking about, um, you know, like the most uh, controversial social issues of our time, whereas the average MIT undergrad's course load is <laughs> chemistry and math. So, um, you know, the kinds of conversations they're having and the extent to which they feel they're self-censoring or they're able to get into these issues, and they're, they're operating in very incomparable environments, I would say. So that also, I think, is part of how I see it is you know, MIT is very different from Brown. So how do we measure them against the same yardstick? It's gonna be a flawed yardstick to some extent. It re requires some interpretation. Well, I... I think it's hard to measure from the outside, that's the thing, but as like, a TA or, a, or someone who's regularly involved with students, I guess my the best measure I have is what conversations do I think it's possible to have in, in the classroom and um, how you know the, the vibrancy of the ideas that are emerging. And that's something that um, is really hard to measure, but I think, and it's hard to encourage. So like we've had conversations about should every professor have a section at, their, in, at the top of their syllabus that you know, says something about free expression, even if it's a math class or something. Um, if protesters come into a classroom in the middle of uh, a recitation, should the TA respond to that issue or should they carry on with the lesson? So these are all micro decisions that I think contribute to that environment. Well, I'm um, good. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say. So I think I think um, you know. I, uh, you should take all of these measurements with a grain of salt. There's lots of things that come into them. But I think that the reason I, am, I would be concerned is I don't think that measurement is anomalous, right? So Wayne listed at the beginning a, a number of other surveys that are in line with that. Um, and so when I look at that in aggregate, that tells me we have work to do. You know, another thing, MIT does a lot of internal surveying. Um, and so there are, we can look, I don't know if there is actually a free expression question on those surveys, but there should be. Uh, we should we, we should that. You know, we should add, uh, perhaps add that or look into that. Um, I, I, I do, uh, there's another um, mechanism that we're trying to uh, 
Peko was actually one of the key uh, developers of this to try to get a sense of at least faculty perspectives on these kinds of things. And that's a new um, uh, uh, website and uh, process called Faculty Pulse, where there are questions that are posed to the faculty and they can get to vote on the answers um, anonymously, They're very important. And you get a sense of how people are feeling on a variety of different issues. Um, and uh, I think that's really been an important contribution to the, at least the faculty environment. That, I, mean, I know there was some discussion, I don't know where, where it lies right now, into, into extending that and maybe having another one for the students uh, to take a pulse of the students. Um, but, you know, it's, but, you know, in the end of the day, it's, these are not such easy things to measure. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I'll, really quick, because I know there's a lot of other questions, but, but uh, so yes, the, the, the Graduate uh, Student Council has asked for a pulse so that they will also be launching their own, their own pulse survey. Um, recently, there was a pulse survey question, which was, um, do you fear retaliation when you speak your mind? And from who? So it was, a list of, it was a list of people that you might fear retaliation from. So this was a question that was asked to the faculty. Okay. The, the second most selected group was the administration. I fear retaliation from the administration when I speak my mind. Does anybody want to take a guess at who the first, the, the group that the students, exactly, it's the students. The, 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 the group that the faculty are most nervous about that they're going to get in trouble with is the students. Um, and part of that is, I think, the changing landscape of things like social media um, and you know, how, how information travels. Um, so it's, there, there's technologies that are turning these into new questions that we haven't had to grapple with before. With the Alumni Free Speech Alliance, thank you for uh, joining us this morning, and thank you for the work that you're you're doing. You mentioned the dispute resolution role that you've sort of taken on. Uh, CAFSI has. Um, could you explain a little bit more about how that has worked up to till now, and and do you plan to formalize that? That seems to me, uh, on the surface, to be a really good thing if if it becomes a formal process where you can put some some, you know, kind of dampen down these things before they, they blow up. So we know we, we you know, th just to be clear, we don't adjudicate questions. We just uh, try to um, tamp down concerns, educate people about what the rules are and the laws are, and, and, and um, so, uh, um, you know, so some of those questions have come up that, that only Peck and I as, co as uh, co-chairs have uh, addressed. Some of them have come before the committee um, that for discussion. Um, and really what we're planning to do is make a recommendation as to what that process should look like going forward. You know, because CAFSI itself ha has only a mandate to go through the end of December of this year. Um, and that's the, gonna be the end of it. Maybe it'll be extended. That's, you know, to be decided. Yeah, and also one thing that would be we're thinking about right now is how can we make some kind of a case law um, document for the for the discussions that we've had because there you know we, we you do start to see a pattern right there's a rhythm to it and it's like okay th this is the framework that we have consistently used to think about these kinds of cases and the the challenge there is of course there there are privacy concerns since these are real issues that have come up so we need to think about how can we. Um, you know, make like synthetic scenarios or something where we can articulate to the community how the thinking of the, of the committee got to the recommendation that they got to. And I, I think sharing that would actually be very valuable for the community to understand wh how do we weigh different things when we talk through these, these, these um, um, scenarios. Thank you. So I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a philosophy postdoc at MIT, and I just wanted to follow up on this sort of discussion of the measurement of self-reported self-censorship, because it just gets, I mean, all over the place. If you talk about free speech, that's always the measurement that's used. And I'm a bit skeptical, not just of how good of a measurement it, that is, but even if it's going in the right direction. So when I, when I try to read that literally, and I think, like, do I stop and sometimes not express an opinion in fear of the consequences? It seems really hard for me to imagine the world in which that's not true. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose, like, when I think about my department, I think that the free speech environment has improved since I arrived in MIT six years ago, and yet I feel like the number of people who would express, who would say yes to that question might have gone up, 
Because in the past, if you think we all agree here, this is the right view, then just any extreme opinion that comes into my head, I'll just express. And I feel like if you're in an environment where you say we all have really deeply held convictions that sometimes disagree with each other, like I, I might not express the really extreme viewpoint that comes in my head if I'm not prepared to defend it and there might be consequences to that and people might come back at me if I'm making factual claims that aren't true. And so I just, I, I'm just sort of skeptical, I guess, of whether that's really the ideal, a world in which nobody feels like they're self-censoring just because it seems like that's most likely to happen if people feel like they all agree and maybe a little self-censorship happens because people mm -hmm. recognize that there are consequences to what they say because they're not in this sort of position of power where everybody has to agree with them. I, 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 I would like to chat with you afterwards to figure out what we should be measuring. I think that's a really great point, a really great point. Um, you know, and I think, I think there are also people who are, um, I mean, one of the things we've come up, so freedom of expression gives you the right to say a lot of things. Um, it does not mean, mean that people are not gonna judge you for what, you, what, you, what has been said, right? We're allowed to judge each other and make a, form opinions about e each other. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a line that gets crossed when you go to think about retaliation, where there are um, consequences beyond people forming opinions about you. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, I think everything you said is, is super important and I would actually, I think it would be great if you could come talk to us and tell us what we should measure. <laughs> and just to add to that, I think like one, one thing we've been thinking about a lot is how um, protecting free expression and encouraging <laughs> it is not a, a binary, you know, switch of like, yes, no, allowed or prohibited. It's like, it raises the bar for discourse in some ways because um, in a world where we, it, you know, we, we're encouraged and we're allowed to speak our minds, j just as you said, it, it also invites counter speech. It invites like, a, I mean, that's the whole point, right? That we get to a kind of more elevated, deeper, um, more expansive discourse, like that's what we want. <laughs> and so I think like that kind of pressure of, oh, if I do say this, then I have to think through it. I have to think about like the consequences of, you know, of the friction that might create, the, the, the opposing idea that it, might invite, that it might invite, that's like always hard to hear. Like that's, that's, not, um, that's not a bad pressure. Right. Um, and that's not something that we want to get rid of. But the kind of other, flavor of pressure of if I say anything there's that 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 creates tension there's no space for it and I'll be like locked away somewhere <laughs> like that's that's a very different kind of pressure that way I think we are trying to avoid so um, just being nuanced about this isn't going to solve all our problems we like free speech is hard <laughs> like having yeah. really good conversations that go places is is really hard and so kind of resetting expectations in the community to, to expect a certain level of discomfort, to expect a certain a level of rigor is, is like part and parcel of the, the project, I think. Yeah, agreed. And I, th I think the, the, uh, to follow up on that, like it, getting some consistency around our definitions in the community, like, like disagreeing is not retaliation. Those are two very different things, and, and where people put those boundaries is probably very different in, in the community. Hey, uh, my name is Mimi Yang. I'm a co-chair of uh, Boston Alliance of Braver Angels, but also I'm a research fellow at Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, I'm very interested in the concept of censorship and the retaliation, whether self or imposed, because I'm, uh, I don't want to mention the journal's name. I'm on an editorial board, and I'm not Jewish. I'm not Palestinian. So there was a, a monograph, uh, you know, the, the, the board considered as pro-Palestinian or as a propaganda. So since I'm neutral, they want me to make a decision to accept it or not. So they call it a political propaganda. But to me, I see there's a good point to set up a historical society encompassing both the Jewish and the Palestinian. So the difficult part is this is retaliation and it was rejected by committee votes because they think they believe that it was a propaganda. So that really affects that this young scholar's career. Um, so my question 
is from outside MIT perspective, I want to understand within MIT, how do you deal with this censorship and the reta retaliation in scholarship? <laughs> So first, I'm not sure I have a good answer to that because I'm in the School of Engineering. So, so I mean, it's, like we, like our, uh, I, I don't know, Angie, maybe you have a, a better perspective on that from political science. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would also, I think a lot of political scientists would, would say that they're, you know, yeah. positivist scientists right. and it doesn't come close to propaganda, you know, the work that they do. But I think you see this a lot in like the legal, the, the legal journals um, in the past year who have struggled with the question of whether to publish certain pieces or not. Um, I think that it's, uh, we do see a lot of political pressure on editorial boards um, that, that does harm freedom of expression. And even, you know, whether something is propaganda or not, like, I mean, I'm not having read this piece, it's very, it's a difficult judgment to make. And so if, if um, you know, we have an ecosystem where different journals or different forums that land in different places ideologically are all upholding these standards of will, um, you know, err on the side of allowing free expression and allow, you know, maybe if, uh, you know, another contingent of scholars thinks this is propaganda, that they could counter that publicly by publishing something in response. You know, that's kind of the way that we would hope the ecosystem would work. But I think we are seeing a lot of cases where um, editorial boards are sort of shutting down that conversation before it can even happen out of, out of fear of retaliation or, or political pressure. So. I, I think it's just, it's difficult because we're, we're trying to fix, improve this at all levels in academia, um, and it's, it's problematic at, at many levels. Okay, uh, we're out of time. I know there are other questions, and I'm sorry we don't have time to get to them, but let's give a great hand to Mike Hecko and Amy for a great panel. <laughs>